Okay, hello YouTube! We're gonna be learning about the evil space elves today. We learn about the space elves, but I also wanna learn about the necrons because gosh darn it, necrons just have some has they just have something in them that interests me. I don't know, man. It's ancient and I like anything that's ancient apparently. <laughs> as soon as they were like, yeah, and now they're dead and like asleep and they're catacombs, I'm like, ah, catacombs you say? Ancient, you say? Mm, you have my interest now. <laughs> it's like it's like every single freaking time, man. Every single time. Is there any good videos about Necrons, man? I want to learn about them. I wanted to read this book that I believe it was set in the time when Necrons were still alive. I'm not certain. It was one of the books that Bricky recommended, but apparently it is not really available online to download or let listen or something and when i checked it on the official website it was over 30 euro and i was like i'm good man i don't i don't wanna i don't wanna deal with this today we're gonna be watching the drakari dark elves the darkest faction and warhammer more lore more learning let's go will tori ever buy minis find out uh, in the future <laughs> <laughs> YouTube is great indeed it is. Let's go. Let's watch the video. It is a bit different format than normally. So let, let's see how this goes. Mm -hmm. The Warhammer universe is an incredibly dark and disturbing place. It's full of unimaginable horrors and stuff formed from the most twisted of nightmares. That is makes sense. It's a it's a it's a lore of it's a world of war. And hammer! <laughs> I'm sorry. To say, there's a lot of competition for the most disturbing faction in this hellscape. But to mm. me, none embody the true essence of cruelty and depravity and outright evil better than the Drukhari. Now, they are mm -hmm. a faction of emo BDSM space elves that exist only to inflict as much misery and suffering as possible. They are a race. Wait, weren't they uh, not only about being. About suffering and pain, but also about pleasure. Weren't they actually taking pleasure out of that pain? It, well, am I am I missing a point here? I thought that that was the the thingy. Yes. Okay. Okay. Of artists and scientists, musicians and gladiators, all that take living to the extreme in infinitely new mm. directions, mm. each mm. more horrifying than the last. They are so mm. cartoonishly evil that, from my perspective kind of make the perfect bad guys. So join me mm. into this journey into the depraved as we take a deep dive beneath the rotting surface and figure out mm. exactly what makes the Dark Eldar tick. What, 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 what? I wonder, I wonder, like, this is, I think, one of not many universes when elves are more evil than orcs. <laughs> Orcs in this universe are surprisingly innocent. They're just little dum-dums. They're just little dum-dums charging forward. <laughs> it's so funny how orcs are kind of the innocent boys here. <laughs> I love it. Mm. So I'll preface this with probably the most important thing you need to understand about the Drukhari. And that is that they quite literally have an addiction to inflicting pain on others. The mm. desire to torture and torment other living creatures is so strong of a biological need for them that you could directly compare it to eating or drinking for us. Is it biological need or is it need or, um, due to Slanesh? Because they created Slanesh and Slanesh was like, ah, now your nature is pain. <laughs> Like, I don't think it's their biology, right? I think it's the influence of the goddess that they're kind of both. Yes, Slanish too. Okay, okay. I, I get it, I get it. Okay. Now, this can take countless different forms, from the constant raids of unprotected worlds from the powerful cabals or the opulent blood sports of the witch cults, or even to... Wait, 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 wait. They have witch cults? I'm missing some information here. What? I didn't know that they have witch cults. No one told me. Hmm the twisted experiments of the homunculi. They are a hedonistic and sadistic people that truly mm. delight in the suffering they inflict. Whether that be oh, the orchestra of screams heart. they conduct out of their victims, or the feeling of skin parting against their blades, or even other countless forms of meticulous savagery too terrible to mention here on YouTube. 
<laughs> the Drukhari are a race of pirates and slavers that descend upon unsuspecting worlds to wreak untold havoc, sowing terror and destruction in their wake. They descend from the sky in bladed raiding vehicles to pillage and plunder. But these individuals are not after gold or fancy jewels like the pirates of old. No, these pirates come for a much more disturbing bounty. They come to take slaves. Slaves that inevitably will be subject to the worst torture imaginable, used in horrific experiments, or even turned into furniture by some depraved Dark Eldar artist. I wonder if... Battle sisters they are close to? Oh no. I wonder if when they are getting the slaves and he mentions experiments, right? Do they do experiment actually for science? Or are they uh, experiments more of, hmm, how long can someone survive if I cut off this part of their body? Like, I wonder what type of experiments. Bit of both. Okay. And also creating furniture out of slaves. I hope they're dead after before they started the procedure, but knowing their faction, they're probably not. It's for fun and science. The best type of ones. Yeah, the best type of experiments. Fun and science. Oh, no. Now, the lucky ones will be thrown into great arenas where they'll be hunted and slaughtered by the most voracious creatures the Drukhari have collected. All for the twisted and ecstatic amusement of thousands of Drukhari spectators. Or so, being a gladiator slave is actually lucky because you die quickly. Interesting! Even worse, they may be bought and sold to wealthy aristocrats that are deeply disturbed even by Eldar standards. Now, during a dark Eldar raid, it unfortunately is not uncommon for individuals to end their own lives by their own means, as a quick mm. death is always preferable to being captured by the dark Eldar. Individuals are told to, quote, pray you are worthless enough to not be noticed. Pray you will see dawn's light with your eyes intact. And above all else, pray they don't take you alive. Oh. So what does a Drukhari raid actually look like? Now, a raiding party is basically a tentative circumstantial alliance formed from members of the various sub-factions. The bulk of individuals involved in such an escapade are normally members of a powerful cabal, as they make up the bulk of Dark Eldar military forces. However, it is also not uncommon for members of the witch cults or even the covens to be in temporary alliance with them and join. So in general, at the very big, like uh, on normal daily basis, they're not too keen on working together. But when they decide, hey, we kind of need more slaves, they're like, OK, we're going to give you five people. We're going to give you another five. And all the factions kind of like decide for that time being to work together. <laughs> This is, this is great. It's like, hmm, we don't like each other, but we kind of run out of our toys. Let's work together to grab more toys. <laughs> oh my God. Like smaller clans. Yeah, makes sense. Makes sense. I get it. I get it. Okay. <laughs> Forces for what is known as a real space. Based on mobility and power. Okay. So like orcs. The more powerful is stronger and leads. <laughs> nah, I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm joking. I know. I know it's not like it works. I know. Raid. Now, their technology is so advanced that it often appears to be some form of sorcery by civilians. Guns oh. that fire neurotoxin coated crystals or beam. This doesn't look like witch. This looks like something from Resident Evil place or something. I don't know. Like Fed Alerts? Oh, okay. Beams of concentrated dark matter. These are but a few examples of the hyper-advanced weaponry of the Drukhari. Now, arrogance and narcissism are two traits that are deeply ingrained in the sociopathic mm. and psychotic race of the Dark Eldar. Mm. Many of them will conduct their raids exclusively from the decks of their vehicles, preferring to hunt down their victims in their crafts, as no self-respecting true kin would muddy their boots with the dirt of a filthy mon -key world. Uh. Now, many of them are also hyper-intelligent as well as physically dangerous, as many have studied and understand multiple languages spoken by the other species. Knowledge like this is often useful in their raids to interpret where more prey may be hiding. Now, that being said, none of them would ever dirty their mouths with the language of a lesser species. <laughs> so this often makes negotiation incredibly difficult with them. After the raid is concluded and the Dark Eldar have captured as many slaves as possible, in some instances quite literally taking the entire population of a world, they'll load Damn. up their raiding vehicles with all of their dead and dying allies. Now, for such a sadistic race, this kind of seems like an oddity. Do they bandage their wounds? Do they give medical <laughs> aid to the brothers and sisters they fought beside? Or do they have some sentimental reason to gather the remains for like a funerary service? 
Far from it, as such kindness is a disease, a weakness more suited for the sentimental Mon Key. Which, by the way, is a slur that the Dark Eldar and Eldar use for humans. If you see an image of one of their raiding vehicles, they're covered in spikes and blades and hooks and stuff like that. Well, those spikes are literally there for them to put their allies on. They'll shove them on the spikes or drag them on the hooks behind their vehicles. The comfort or even survival of their allies is of no importance to them, as the Dark Eldar can actually use suffering as a form of pseudo-magic, a magic that they can use to literally revive the dead, even if all that's left of them is like a severed finger. Now, these rites are conducted by mad- So... They're taking the injured brothers and sisters, putting them on a spaceship that is rather fastly going through a space because it's fine, because their pain and suffering will, will give them power to revive them any way if needed. Definitely sounds easier than just making them not die. Yeah! <laughs> it's like... <laughs> Listen, you're gonna be on this spike, so we can gather some magic. Don't worry, if you die, we're just gonna use that magic on reviving you. It's fine. Uh, makes sense, makes sense. All in and everything. Yeah, I can see that. Kind of like Doug from Team Fortress. So yeah, it's kind of that vibe, but even worse. That's the Drakari way. We just do everything thousand percent. Let's go. Scientists known as the homunculi. And don't get it twisted. They don't do this out of any kind of kindness for their siblings, as the homunculi are some of the most powerful and influential members within Dark Eldar society. And it always pays to have a legion of people in debt to you. And ah. don't worry, we'll get into the homunculi in of a little course. bit. So why are the Dark Eldar like this? Surely there has to be a reason for their madness. How does an entire society become so unbelievably cruel? In the Warhammer universe, a lot of horrible things are done in the name of the greater good. War crimes are committed on a daily occurrence here. But when you look at the Imperium of Man, they normally have a logical reason for doing what they do. Some of them, let's not overgeneralize, some of them have a logical reason to do what they do. There are some that not so much. We learned about this in a uh, short from Bricky. Yeah, why they are like this? Because they were really searching how to be more entertained because they got bored because there was nothing for them to do. So because they were extremely bored and smart, um, they started to devolve in the wrong direction. For the Emperor, no, 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 I don't mean the Emperor ones. I mean the heretics that are not for the emperor. Not all of them you would look at and say, yeah, I would understand your logic. Let's be honest. For example, the ordering of exterminatus on a planet is done to control heretics a Heretics are threat, not humans. Of sacrificing course, Sacrificing a few to save the many. When it comes to the Dark Eldar, they are intrinsically tied they to something heretics. even more depraved than themselves. The one they call She Who Thirsts, the Chaos God, Slanesh. You see, thousands of years ago, Eldar society was far from the splintered and rivaling groups we know today. They were one of two races engineered by the Old Ones to fight against the Necrons and the Catan during a period known as the War in Heaven. Now, this period lasted for millions of years and will honestly have to be covered in another video because there's a lot to it. But after the war had finally ended, the Necrons went to sleep deep within their tomb worlds and the Old Ones regrettably went extinct. Now, it was the Eldar who were left to inherit the galaxy. Wait a second, Necron, the old ones, were the predecessors to, to Necrons, because Necrons have been created by the gods from the old ones, but the old ones got extinct because they became Necrons? Wasn't that the, the story of them? No, what was the old ones then? I'm getting something, something is missing, because I remember that Necrons used to be living creatures. And then they were transformed into their form of being the mechanical robots that they are. I thought that that was from the old ones. The ones that were like dying from cancer constantly made a deal with a different god. Were the Necrons the ones that they were dying? Like, um, like within 30 years. The old ones refused their wish for immortality. Oh, because the old ones refused their uh, wish of the Necrons, and that's why the Necrons became the way that they are. Okay, okay, I mixed the old ones with the Necrons. And the Necrons killed the old ones, right? They were fighting with them and they killed them. That was the story. Or am I also misaligning this one in my brain already? This is so messy sometimes. It's getting confusing. <laughs> I think that one was uh, Katan. Oh, okay, okay with no great enemies to fight. Who helped the Necrons? Oh, okay. And no masters to hold their leashes, the Eldar became the dominant force. And with the need mm. for military conquest completely eliminated, 
Well, the people of the Eldar were free to pursue pleasure instead of violence. Yep. This took the form of art and music and basically just living Look life to the fullest. Pretty. Without the existential dread of impending annihilation, it turns out that they had a lot of free time to pick up a hobby or two. And here's the thing about the Eldari. They actually experience sensation and emotion on a level that we can't even begin to comprehend. Mm -hmm. Despair and ecstasy, the peaks and valleys of emotion, are so much more intense than anything you can imagine. Take the happiest and most ecstasy-inducing moment of your life and magnify it by about a thousand. And that's what the Eldar consider normal. Oh. It'll make your brain hurt trying to even comprehend how they experience things. Now this would make sense as they are all gifted with spectacular psychic abilities. Mm -hmm. Psychers are pretty rare in the kingdom of mankind, but every single member of the Eldar was psychically gifted. Yep. Now with all things pleasurable, if you are not able to restrain yourself and you don't put limits on it, that thing eventually grows old and you need to kick it up a notch to feel the same level of enjoyment. And this can be a slippery slope to damnation and addiction, where you slip further and further into your hedonistic ways, your interests growing slowly more depraved over time. Now, thankfully for us humans to find ourselves in such a space, we only have a limited lifespan, but the elder yep. of these times were functionally immortal. So they had a very long time to find exactly how deep too into long. excess an individual can get. I hope you're they became right. addicted to ever increasing sensational extremes. And as their passions took on darker and more debased forms, their concept of morality began to diminish. They were a species that knew no threat. Nothing could challenge them or their rule. This was a breeding ground for rampant ignorance and narcissism. They saw all other sentient life as beneath them, similar to how we humans look at ants. And the more extreme individuals within Eldar society began to gather in what were known as pleasure cults. Now, in the beginning, they existed in shadow, their members only numbering in the handfuls. However, as okay. time went on, more and more members began to seek them out, and they steadily grew larger and larger. Eventually, these cults got so powerful, they took over as the main government. Oh boy, so literally, they became so big that they took over the government. They're like, now, we shall create chaos everywhere chaos <laughs> oh no burning <laughs> force not chaos i'm sorry pleasure just fun <laughs> everyday eldar society dug deeper and deeper into their excess the and depravity, constantly finding new extreme limits before shattering them with reckless abandon their debauchery began to reach peaks never before seen by any sentient species and here's the thing about the warhammer universe Emotional extremes and beliefs can begin to coalesce in a parallel dimension known as the Warp. Every sinful and horrific act that the Eldar participated in gave energy to a decadently rotten entity yeah. that was growing just beyond the veil of our universe. Every sensation, every emotion, every peak and valley the Eldar experienced created a psychic ripple within the Immaterium. And oh yeah, it makes sense because they're also all psychic. Um, they're all gifted with psychic which was connected to the warp which is connected to chaos so their actions are even more magnified and having effect on the warp and chaos gods than most of other species ah oh, this makes sense hi dark beast welcome happy to see you how are you doing today oh yeah that makes sense why slanesh became a thing because they literally have that effect oh no and this energy would gather together and eventually give They had such way to them? Yep. Hi, heretic! Welcome! How are you doing today? Their horniness created a dark entity, basically, yeah. They influenced it that much. Yup. Rise to a psionic tidal wave of destruction. A creature of unimaginable power and cruelty. An entity known to the Eldar as She Who Thirsts. But the real name is Slanesh, the Chaos God of Excess. On one fateful day, this reservoir of hedonistic sight Parts of her are scary, and parts of her are very beautiful. Gotta say that. <laughs> Psychic energy reached a breaking point and birthed a literal chaos god. The resulting birth scream was a massive psychic explosion that ripped into our universe like a supernova. A massive That's tsunami of psychic mm -hmm. energy lashed out in every direction. Every world caught in the blast saw its citizens obliterated instantaneously. Their souls Oops. ripped from their body and subsequently devoured by the ravenous newborn god. Now, each Oops. one of these souls was then subject to eons of suffering and delectable agony in the gullet of Slanesh. Something Oops. like 99% of the Eldar did not survive this event and they are now a fractured and dying people, doing everything they can to postpone their inevitable extinction.
Now the circumstances of all the survivors were different. Which is interesting. Headbutt, thank you. She's shapeshifter and seducer. Oh, shapeshifter. That makes sense. Good night, Flay. Thank you so much for joining. I appreciate it. Thank you, thank you. Sleep well. Have a great dreams. This is interesting. They are trying to survive because they know that they are um they know that they are very close to being extinct. But at the same time, they are so deep down into this darkness, a lack of morality and long longing for the extremes that they are unable to work together to actually make it happen. So they are kind of not even helping each other or themselves in any way because they are unable to, because they just need more and more of the thinky. They extremed themselves into a corner. Yeah, kind of. Different. <laughs> The Exodites had fled years before in search of life outside of the Empire, as well as the craft worlders whose ships were outside of the blast radius. Now, the citizens of a city known as Kimura were shielded from the initial shockwave as their city was deep in a pocket dimension between the universes, known as oh. the Webway, an ancient network of tunnels that spread across the galaxy, allowing faster than light travel to those familiar with its corridors. The Kimura Shelby, welcome! Happy to see you! How are you doing today? Hi, hi! Kamoran people and their descendants would eventually become what we know today as the Drukhari or the Dark Elf. Oh. But just because they survived that initial explosion did not mean they were safe from the hunger of she who thirsts. Oh, no, For you see, not. these people were incredibly arrogant and refused to change their ways. If anything, digging deeper and deeper into their extremes. But the gluttony of Slanesh knows no bounds, and even safe within the webway, the psychic imprint of she who thirsts never-ending hunger was slowly siphoning away their souls, bit by bit, every minute of every day, till hmm. one day they would be entirely consumed. The happy ah. afterlife that their people had envisioned, where they would join with their pantheon of gods, was no more, as Slanesh had personally seen to the eradication of all of them. And the only thing that awaited- Wait, so Slanesh killed their gods? Uh oh. This is uh, the webway the emperor wanted to build before he got injured? Oh, okay. No, not exactly. Oh, okay. Did the Eldar in death was an eternity of agony. Now over time, each of the remaining Eldar factions would eventually devise their own ways to halt the advance of Slanesh on their souls. The craft worlds and the Exodites who refused to give up their psychic abilities <laughs> even though they directly courted Slanesh, used soul-protecting gems known as soul stones. These gems capture their souls at the moment of their death, before they can go screaming into the warp. Now their allies can plug those stones into a vast crystalline structure known as the World Spirits for the Exodites or the Infinity Circuit for the Craftworlders. Now their spirits are free to roam throughout their vast networks, never being too far from their descendants. The Dark Eldar, however, realized that Slanesh fed on their suffering, and drip by drip, would slowly drain their souls away completely. However, over time, they realized a very dark truth, that they had a real chance of salvation and could stop the siphoning of their souls. They realized that others could suffer in their place. You see, by in Oh, so one of the factions decided we're gonna save ourselves so, so we don't go into the warp and uh, forever be um in agony with Slanesh because that's no fun. While the other was like, hmm, if we make everyone around us suffer, Slanesh will be fine and she's not gonna chomp us, she's gonna chomp everyone else. <laughs> it's like, yeah, we're just gonna give her a different, uh, different thingy to chomp. Resting after university classes? Happy to hear you can rest now. Hope your day was okay. They offer a better prey. They're like, hey, hey, look, we're not so tasty. Look at these people. Look at these monkeys. Aren't they tasty? <laughs> Inflicting misery on other sentient species and extending it out as long as possible, the agonizing psychic energy they generated would feed the Dark God. In a sense, this would stop the advance of Slanesh onto their soul. Oh, hey, this reminds me of the Deadpool movie that we watched. <laughs> as they would ignore the individual Eldar for that moment, choosing to feed on this newfound banquet of anguish instead. Mm. Now, Dark Eldar, who have gone a long time without committing such horrific acts, appear physically gaunt and weak, uh -oh. withered and old, as their souls are slowly siphoned away. You can almost think of them like psychic vampires that feed off misery rather than blood. Now, after feeding, a member of the Drukhari species is immediately rejuvenated. Their skin oh. is young and supple again, their eyes shimmering with newfound regeneration. Gone is their withered and decrepit forms, old age reversed in an instant. 
they appear young and beautiful and above all else powerful once again this so basically they can like okay so for like few years or whatever the time is i don't know what are the time frames i'm not i don't have to kill oh wait i'm feeling kind of weak let me torture this one person <laughs> Oh, look at that. I'm now perfectly good. The perfect way to get rid of the wrinkles. <laughs> well, I know that they enjoy it. They, they, don't, they don't see it as something that they have to do. They see it as something. Oh, I want to do that. <laughs> this newfound glory it's is fun. temporary, however, as they must inevitably feed on suffering once more. Of course. And make no mistake here. Although this is a necessity to them, as in if they don't do this, they will die. The Dark Eldar take absolute ecstatic pleasure in such acts. They thoroughly enjoy the agony they create. All other species in the galaxy are nothing more than chattel to them. To be yep. used, drained, and They're discarded. The toys. Even other Eldar, like their cousins of the craft worlds, are seen as weak. Individuals who have abandoned what it truly means to be Eldari. Who have forgotten the- Which is interesting because they're not the original ones anymore. <laughs> they're the subspecies now. The old ways and cling to fabricated ideals and nonsensical virtues. The Dark Eldar are the only real true kin. They're the mm. only true Eldari. So I mentioned before that the Dark Eldar come from one city in particular called Kimura. So what actually is Kimura? So back before the fall of the Eldari, Kimura was a great and powerful city. Now it was okay. located deep within the webway, which you can think of like a pocket dimension between the warp and real space. No one Eldar faction had direct control over Kimura, and it served as kind of a melting pot for all the Eldar. It was originally a trade city and a port hub, but as time went on, it became a spectacular tribute to debauchery. It was a place where pleasure cults were at their most powerful, and- I wonder if this pocket, because it was created by many Elders, I'm presuming, it's not something that you can, you know, snap your fingers and it's gonna appear. You have to have a lot of psychic power to freaking create the pocket. If it's still there and they're still living in it, but because they don't want to sever their psychic connections, this is why it's still actually affecting them. Yeah, the webway was their creation. So now no one from outside can go in, right? It's like like none other species can enter this webway, right? It's not possible because it's made by them. It's theirs. You have to have probably a strong connection with it to get there. Or how does it work? Because it's uh, it's between dimensions. So how do they even navigate that? Oh, I'm so confused. My brain. Yeah, Amber wanted to use this idea, but I'm so confused how exactly it worked. Every conceivable form of excess could be experienced here in spades. It was basically like the Las Vegas of a galaxy full of Las Vegas. Oh, damn. Nowadays, Kimura is even more twisted. It is an infinite corridor of jagged and serrated towers, networks of alleyways and buildings all on top of one another. It is home to some mm. of the most opulent and ludicrously extravagant arenas ever created, where Dark Eldar citizens can witness savage battles of the witch cult gladiators, or even mm. see slaves forced to fight terrifying alien beasts. Every form of excess can be found here, whether it be art, music, drugs, or pleasures of the flesh. Everything you could possibly imagine saturates every inch of this place and these activities are taken to their most extremes. It's not uncommon to see palaces of undulating living flesh that host insanity-inducing art galleries, Ew. blasphemous cathedrals dedicated to alien drugs and debauchery number in the thousands, while decadent brothels home to murder sex cults exist in every corner. Kamora is a city of excess and great wealth, and countless gangs vie for power here. Now, gang warfare is a pretty common sight and basically a way of life, which makes sense since the Dark Eldar are a species of narcissistic alien psychic vampires that are As I remember, even orcs dislike the Dakari. I can see why. I, I can see why orcs may not like Dakari at all. Orcs have at least some logic and camaraderie in place, while Dakari is just everyone for themselves and we just wanna we just wanna torture everyone around us orcs can enjoy the fight against humans yeah they and they can enjoy the fights right but they're not gonna specifically go and torture their wounded brothers and stuff like that yeah i, I can see why obsessed with furthering their own goals and are held back by no moral code this is a place where only the ruthless survive and spectacular mm. wealth awaits anyone bold enough to take it. Now 
No, because daiquiri are the way that they are. I'm presuming that there is no such thing with daiquiri as new daiquiri being created or conceived or whatever. I don't know how they were getting into being as an elder. I'm presuming they were some type of conceiving there. I have no idea. It's... <laughs> Guess I, I have no idea how uh, Warhammer went with that one, but I'm presuming that because they are dying species, they do reproduce. Okay, so they do reproduce. Okay, I thought that that would not be that would not be a possibility in their current state. Okay, that's interesting. Good to know. They have to replenish those. Yeah, I was just thinking how. Like I thought that it's not actually happening. I I don't know for some reason because they can revive people. I thought that they just in infinitely revive each other, but they don't really have new blood in there. Now, the deeper you dive into this twisted nexus, the more the laws of reality start to break. Kimura oh. is actually larger on the inside than it would appear to be on the surface. By of all course. accounts, it stretches in every direction for infinity. The deepest oh, and darkest that? corners are home to some pretty messed up individuals. Now, this is where you'll find the laboratories of the homunculi covens, oh, twisted palaces dedicated to the horrors of science, where all manner of experimentation is conducted. Now, if you were to travel even deeper, you may find yourself in an area known as Alindra, a bizarre and twisted place where the laws of reality start to break down and darkness seems to have gained sentience. Now, this oh? is a place where the creatures known as mandrakes reside. They're seemingly Mandrakes. Eldar in origin, but they've become twisted by shadows. They have the ability to disappear into a shadow and reappear anywhere else in the universe. They act as assassins for hire, and what's interesting about them is they don't ask for any huge sums of money. Sometimes they deal in slaves, which is not uncommon for the Dark of Eldar, course. but more often than not, they ask for truly esoteric things. Do you want somebody on the other side of the galaxy taken out? No problem. All it will cost you is a name, a whisper, a heartbeat, or any other seemingly random and bizarre forms of payment. Now, at first glance, this seems like a pretty good deal. You're getting the services of- I would not trust if someone tells me, just give me your name and I'm gonna kill someone on the other side of galaxy. No worry, bro, trust me, it's okay. Yeah, no, I'm not giving my name to that one. <laughs> Especially if they can just teleport whatever and are very seemingly weird and in the depths of depths of depths. And I'm good. <laughs> the best assassins in the galaxy for next to nothing. But anyone who's familiar with these creatures know that to enter a pact with the Mandrakes is an enormous risk. And only the most determined or stupid Eldar noble would choose to be in debt to them. And only the truly idiotic would renege on the deal and deny them what they are owed. Double crossing is a way of life in Kimura, but everyone knows that you don't double cross the man. That will just kill you, man. You're you're literally you're literally are trying to get the guy to kill someone, and they literally did it, and you don't want to give them payment. You sure about that? <laughs> they are very cult-like, so they have witches, wizards, and space ninja wizards. Yeah, I'm good. <laughs> Hello there, SGT. Hello, welcome. How are you doing today? Happy to see you. Hi, hi. Drakes. Now, on the topic of power, most believe that Abdul Vect is the leader of the Drukhari, as he is certainly the most influential figure hmm. within their ranks. The reality is that the Dark Eldar are a species of narcissists, self-serving individuals who they are more likely to backstab you than follow through on any kind of agreement. Anyone who appears to be loyal to Abdul Vect is more likely to be putting on an air of sycophancy, and uh. he is well aware of this. But as the old saying goes, keep your enemies close. Kamora yeah. is a very tentative and tumultuous political landscape of hundreds of rival factions. Now, this isn't to say that alliances don't happen, as they do quite frequently, but everyone involved in them is out for themselves, holding no loyalty to anyone, even members of their own clan. Now, don't misunderstand. Everyone isn't on equal footing. Far f He basically understands that while people listen to him and do what he asks them to do, they have their own gain in it, and it's not because they are loyal or they like him, it's because they know they will gain out of it. So I'm presuming, because he understands how this world works, he also knows what to tell people to do if he needs something. I know more about the fantasy drug, he makes sense. From it, the city has a pretty well-defined hierarchy with Standard the high-born politics. aristocrats normally at the top while the lowborn or even the vat-grown half-borns make up the bottom rung. Power and influence are every- How do you get that? 
Is it half burned because of the slaves that they take? Is that how it goes here? Because I would think that they're too proud to have half-borns and they would just treat them like the slaves or a lower class so I'm surprised that they are even included in somewhat their structure I would I would literally think that they don't really care and would just torture them for their funsies they have many slaves from many worlds and <laughs> last for fun yeah but it's like I wouldn't think that they would consider them in any way. I would think they would just make them into their slaves, like, you know. I wouldn't think that they consider halfborns as anything more than any other species. Lower than them. <laughs> that, that would they do that with anyone? Oh, I see. <laughs> I won't be here long since I'm sleepy. That's okay. I hope you rest well soon then. Everything within Kimura. And everybody and is out to get as much as this. possible. Abdulvect is certainly one of the most powerful individuals, but even he is not entirely safe, as every dark corner here could have a blade waiting for him. <laughs> and although the list of Drukhari sub-factions is incredibly numerous, for the Dark Eldar you can think of their society as being broken up into three distinct groups, the Cabals, the Witch Cults, and the Homunculi Covens. Each one of them is incredibly distinct from one another as they all have varied and differing cultures, goals, and economic systems. And although Dark Eldar society seems to always be one second away from midnight, where at any moment the entire thing will collapse in on itself in a violent and bloody spectacle. The three groups manage to keep a tentative, albeit fractious, peace. In a culture mm. where backstabbing figuratively and literally is a way <laughs> of life, they seem to have a Lol. symbiotic relationship with each other, through trade and favors, as each one of these factions provides something that the others cannot. And when you're in Kimura, no matter what it is you're looking for, there's always someone willing to provide it for a price so let's so basically trading system we live with each other because we need each other let's get a better idea of what these three pillars are all about and let's start with the cabals the cabals are possibly the most straightforward of the drukhari factions they are the most numerous and powerful at least when it comes to physical might as they huh. make up the bulk of their military force they are conclaves of depraved warriors that have hideouts and outposts located in every corner of the dark city some controlling just a few secret locations, while others muster the forces of millions of soldiers and control vast empires. Larger mm. cabals are normally near the top of the Dark Eldar hierarchy, and normally consist of true-born Drukhari soldiers and nobles. Their frequent and violent raids of other planets maintain a steady supply of wealth and slaves to the cabals, meaning so that's why nobles are in the in the army just because it actually pays because they're on the top of the food chain kind of right because they are the ones who provide the slaves which are needed for them to create the suffering for them to survive that makes complete sense and they quite often control the best weaponry and equipment out of any of the three branches now because the cabals are so mighty and oftentimes spread out over such a wide area it's nearly impossible to completely eliminate one. Mm. There'll always be a surviving member that will rebuild it. And seeing how oh, every no. single Dark Eldar citizen has aspirations of great power and influence, it makes a lot of sense that many of them would wish to join a Cabal. Yep. Because listen, you do not get to the top in Kimura without making an absolute metric ton of enemies. There is no of honor or chivalrous ways to gain influence here. You have to get your hands dirty. Through the structure of a Cabal, there's at least a path laid out to reach that upper echelon. There are ranks to be attained and an end goal in sight. Not to mention an enormous amount of protection, as an attack on an individual member is an attack on the entire cabal. Now, that being said, murder and subterfuge are often not just encouraged, but outright required here. Cabals compete with one another for various contracts, not to mention supply lines. A cabal will often not declare war on another organization unless they are absolutely sure that they can wipe them out. A knife in the dark or a poisoned goblet are much more subtle ways of dealing with rivals. And in a sense, this constant warring between the cabals ensures that only the strong survive. Oh, it makes sense because it's kind of the logic of if you want to be in this hierarchy and you want to be, let's say, higher, well, you can't just get it because you did well in battle, right? Like that's, mm -mm. you're gonna get it if that person surprisingly is suddenly unable to fight <laughs> because they're dead. <laughs> and while they that, who knows? Someone stabbed them in an alley. Who could have that been? 
<laughs> makes sense, makes sense. You gotta watch your stuff. <laughs> and that they maintain the best warriors by letting mm. the weak perish. In battle, the Cabalite warriors are absolute savages. Raids are incredibly profitable, so the Cabals that are the most powerful are basically raiding nearly constantly. That wealth is used for some of the best weapons and armor that the Dark Eldar can produce. They are also not adverse to making deals with the homunculi coven. I actually wonder because they have the weaponry. They uh, hard cartel the, uh, all the way. One weak chain pieces can break everything. Oh yeah, so basically they don't have weak uh, weak chain pieces. Like that, that's not a thing in their life. But this is interesting because they have weaponry, and I'm guessing they have to make it themselves because they don't trade with anyone else because those are lower species, right? So why the frick would we trade with them? They are just nothing. But they still need the wealth for it, so I wonder who creates the weapons if not the Kabali that are using the weapons and controlling the weapons. And they are uh, top tier tech. Yeah, I wonder who creates those and how or the witch cults to gain an advantage. Whether that ah, be through purchase of some okay. new experimental drug or employing some of the homunculi's abominations as mercenaries, nothing is off the table. The Cabals view concepts like honor and mercy as a weakness, that in war there is no science such thing as chivalry. Course, they seek to exploit every weakness imaginable and utterly dominate their enemies, striking without warning when they're unprepared and eliminating key command locations, while retreating if they encounter a sizable force. Ambushes, trickery, deception, these are all tools of war, as powerful as any firearm. The Cabals will use these tools to carve a bloody path through soldier and civilian alike. They are ruthless and sadistic killing machines that absolutely delight in the misery they reap. The standard Cabalite warrior even wears a suit of armor that's full of razor blades, as they not only find their own suffering absolutely ecstasy inducing, but the pain keeps their minds razor sharp and Oh yeah, that makes sense. We have razors in our armor to keep our brain razor sharp. Yeah, that definitely how you sharpen your senses. <laughs> no! <laughs> oh, this is just... <laughs> sure makes logic. Yeah, they just need the stimulus. Yeah, they just need the little cutty cuts here and there, man. <laughs> and coffee is weak. Coffee is for weak. Honed to a killing edge. Needless to say, this makes them incredibly dangerous. But the Cabals only really make up a third of what the Dark Eldar actually are. So what about the Witch Cults? What are they- It took me so long to understand this position of the woman. Like, oh my god. I had- It took me so long to understand what's happening here. All about. Now, where the Cabals generate their revenue through raiding, the women of the Witch Cults actually have a much more lucrative way of generating wealth and power. Now, as the Witch Cultists control the many grand arenas found throughout Kimura, these are massive and deranged theaters where Dark Eldar citizens can witness some truly bloody and horrific battles. How these gladiatorial <laughs> pits are so over the top that to compare even the worst one to the most decadent theater mankind has ever created would basically be like comparing a Roman cathedral to a dumpster. So powerful is the bloodlust and desire for violence in the heart of every Dark Eldar citizen that without these arenas, it's very possible that Drukhari society would completely collapse in on itself in Oops. an orgy of gore and violence. So in a sense, the witch cult arenas provide possibly the most essential of all services within Kimura. Makes and the more sense. powerful a witch cult is, the more arenas they control, each generating enormous levels of income. The witches themselves are all spectacular glad- I actually wonder what's their, um, like, uh, money? Uh, what, what is it called? The thing that you trade with, like, what is the- yeah, currency. What is their currency? What are they trading with? What is the wealth that they're gathering? Because I wouldn't say it's money itself like gold. I don't think that's good enough for them. Maybe it would be flesh of some sort. It's, it's like, okay, wealth, but what type of wealth though? <laughs> Th th that's something that is nudging my brain to understand their society. What are they trading with? <laughs> theaters and are also primarily women. Now there are male witches as well, but they are often not as influential or praised as their female counterparts. The witch cults mm -hmm. are a matriarchal society and the male witches, although powerful in their own right, more often than not just serve to produce new witches. 
He's like, haha, the roles has switched and now you here just so there is more of us. <laughs> species is known for many things, one of which is their spectacular, almost superhuman agility and flexibility. To see one in combat is almost like watching a ballerina dance. Their ah, graceful I love movements that. are difficult to keep track of and they can dodge pretty much anything coming at them. They will spin and flip and pirouette over their enemy, leaving them with a slashed throat before they even know what happened. And the witches utilize truly bizarre and exotic weapons, from razor flails to barbed nets. These are weapons that are incredibly difficult to use, but feed into that innate Dark Elder narcissism. <laughs> the witches enjoy using esoteric weaponry that demonstrates their unbelievable skill. It's also incredibly difficult. This really sounds like a very cool sub faction. I'll show you the Dawn of War to intro. Okay, this like this is really cool. Uh, idea of we use very unconventional weapons because we're gonna show you how good we are at fighting with anything that is sharp. This is really cool. I like that idea. Difficult to fight an individual using a weapon that doesn't make any sense. A skilled sword fighter is no match for a witch with a blade that can extend itself into long chains and wrap around them, severing their arm when they go to block a blow. Now the witch's unbelievable reflexes and battle prowess are boosted to even more insane levels through a wide array of combat stems, drugs that were commissioned specifically for them by the homunculi covens. Now these potent cocktails sharpen their senses to ludicrous levels oh. and they enhance pretty much everything about them. From their speed to their toughness to their strength, there is a drug for pretty much every form of combat. And the witch's delight in the pure ecstasy of mixing and matching them all the time, completely addicted to the rush of combat and the drugs that enhance their abilities. Now in combat, the witches don't actually wear any form of armor, other than their gladiatorial outfits that don't really offer much protection and are more for show. They have the story armor. <laughs> they don't need an actual armor, it's fine, plot armor. We'll save the day. <laughs> They're the true form of plot armor. <laughs> Who needs some metal in a war when you have blood? Level 9000 bikini armor, yeah! Their reflexes and heightened sense of awareness are so powerful that they can dodge most incoming attacks, some even having the ability to pirouette around bullets. The arenas that the witches come from are normally structured around a single individual known as a succubus. This is an incredibly mm -hmm. powerful both physically and politically witch cultist who has worked her way to the top. Oftentimes they will employ lesser succubi who work beneath them and run their own arenas, all controlled by the top succubus. They control thousands of gladiatorial witches as well as a vast menagerie of exotic and powerful animals. Oh, their armor is just in the way? Of course it is! Of course it is in the way! Who needs it when you gotta dance around the bullets, man? And the procurement of such beasts is often a reason for witch cult raids, as the more exotic and dangerous their prey, the more money it will bring in for their arenas. However, the beasts have other purposes as well. It is often that they will work out deals with particularly wealthy and influential archons of different cabals, exchanging their exotic troops and beasts in exchange for profit from their raids. It's not uncommon for witches to accompany the cabals into battle and serve as devastating shock troops that slice and dice their enemies into ribbons. <laughs> Every citizen in Kimura understands just how deadly a witch can be, but an entire troop of them is something to truly be feared. So what about the third and final branch of the dark? Okay, so I wonder why are they called witches though? Because they don't seem to be psychic more powerful than any other faction in Dakari, but they are called witches. Is it because of the drags and the way they fight? Is it just because they are so odd they were called witches? Because he, at the very beginning he said that they're using weaponry that almost seems like a dark magic to others. So were they called witches by other species? Because they appeared like ones? I wonder where that name came from. Geldar, the homunculi covens. So the covens are like a dark and twisted reflection of academia. They are a network of genius madmen who have collected together in the pursuit of scientific studies of some. They are the Mechanicus. <laughs> just, just the flesh version of Mechanicus. They have their practices. They summon uh, in abominations and such, for example. Oh, okay, I see. They're quite literally alchemists of pain and misery. Now, each homunculus oh can be thousands of years old every decade spent in rigorous study and depraved experimentation. 
They suffer no restraints on the pursuit of knowledge. They have no code of ethics and no morality to hold them back. They are as much artisans as scholars, as what they are capable of is grotesque and horrific, but undoubtedly incredible. The homunculi are a treasure trove of dark kind of uh, reverse mechanicus maybe yeah maybe something like that they're basically they're I, I, what i meant is it's similar pursuit both of the factions want knowledge right they both want to learn as much as possible the difference is mechanicus has their god that they are praying to and they believe that flesh is weak while elder and uh, their their faction of uh, smart boys is basically we will pursue knowledge for at any cost no matter what stands on our way but we don't see flesh as weak we see it somewhat as a potential and also uh we basically see some emotions as weak so they are kind of similar. Yeah, they need pleasure for flesh and suffering. So it is kind of the, the reverse, where Mechanicus believes this flesh is weak and wants to get rid of it. The Dakari literally needs it to survive. Dark arcane secrets, forbidden knowledge, and the horrors of unrestrained scientific pursuit. No avenue of study is too twisted for the homunculi. And although the covens clutch tightly to their enormous library of trade secrets, the fruits of their labor are available to anyone who would seek them out. That is like with everything in Gamora, for a price. And suffice <laughs> to say, their inventions don't come cheap. Like-minded homunculi maintain vast networks of STEM distilleries, laboratories, and rigorous institutes of study. They offer things like flesh crafting services and ever-increasing array of new and potent combat- Wait, but flesh crafting services? Oh boy. Oh, that doesn't sound good. That sounds, that sounds very dangerous indeed. At drugs esoteric and bizarre weaponry, and all manner of body modification, just to name a few. The homunculi maintain a symbiotic relationship with both the witch cultists and the cabals. To mm. the witch cultists, they provide them with an ever-evolving line of drugs, and mm. oftentimes will maintain a close tie to a powerful succubi. Likewise, the mutants they create make for powerful frontline soldiers utilized by the cabals. So in a sense, these madmen are the glue that holds all three Drukhari branches together. And no two homunculi are the same, each being a completely unique individual. The lairs that they occupy are a twisted reflection of their owners. Palaces made of flesh and bone, filled with furniture made from still living creatures. They're filled oh. with vast bubbling vats of the most horrific substances in the galaxy, with only the soft glow of candles to illuminate the horrors within. It doesn't sound very practical to have furnitures out of still living creatures, but it makes sense. Yet still not very practical though, especially in laboratory. <laughs> These places are a twisting fortress of overlapping corridors and dead ends. And the deeper you go, the more sickening it gets. Now no sane individual would come to such a hellish place of their own free will. Mm. That is to say unless they're after something that only a homunculus can provide. <laughs> now there have actually been instances in the past of people who have come seeking knowledge to study under the homunculi. Now, for obvious reasons, this is normally another member of their own species. Oh, but fuck. there have been some influential humans, such as Fabius Bile, who are on record of having studied under the homunculi. Because to some, knowledge is worth any price. Which is interesting how did that happen, considering homunculi are Dakari, and Dakari believes every other species is lower than them. How would they accept a human studying next to them how would that even happen because if a human was there as a subject well trade is trade oh yeah he probably gave them something that was good he probably found a good deal <laughs> it was a good deal it was a good deal okay okay and no matter how disturbing the homunculi may be it goes without question that they are one of the largest repositories of dark secrets within this entire galaxy but there is one thing in particular that the homunculus can offer that is too tantalizing to resist to the Drukhari, oh. and that is immortality. Now, as mentioned before, they have the ability to bring one of their kin back from the dead, with only a chunk of flesh to work with. They do this by sealing it within a crystalline chamber that is hooked into a network of similar pods, each containing a still-living slave. The homunculus will then activate the torture network, sending all of these individuals into a spiraling agony, 
They then extract the psychic energy generated from the collective suffering of hundreds if not thousands of slaves, and infuse the meat with the distilled essence of pain. Over time, this will regenerate the body and can keep a wealthy Drukhari member alive indefinitely. To enter in such a pact with a homunculus is not a decision to be taken lightly, as it is to permanently offer them a portion of one's soul. Of all oh. members of Drukhari society, crossing the homunculi is possibly the worst decision you could ever make, as you may end up as a permanent resident in their Cathedral of Pain. Now, despite oh. what you may see on the tabletop, the homunculi do not often take to the fields themselves, preferring to dedicate their time to their studies and making deals with other raiding factions to get what they want. Time is the most valuable of all resources, and their time is incredibly expensive. However, there are times when the homunculi will conduct their own raids, whether that be to gather fresh slaves for their- That's interesting. That's very interesting. They must have a lot of slaves sitting in their um, place then if, if, if you need hundreds or thousands to revive one Drakari. Oh boy. <laughs> pain banks, or to seek out new and exotic ingredients for their experimentations. And these ingredients can be pretty bizarre. There's actually one really interesting report of a homunculus raid, where they use these giant floating monstrosities known as pain engines. They were instructed by their masters to specifically capture a Tau fire warrior who was the last surviving member of their squadron and had witnessed all of the other members brutally murdered. For what purpose the homunculi had with such an individual is- Ah, uh, total war warhammer slaves are a form of currency. It makes sense. Still unclear, but it's safe to say it was something pretty horrific. The yeah. creatures the homunculi employ are grotesque monsters, twisted parodies of life hulking abominations with corded muscle and multiple sets of grafted limbs, each wielding twisted weaponry designed to inflict astronomical levels of pain rather than eliminate the threat as quickly as possible. The servants of the homunculi are eager to please their master and delight in trying out new inventions. A homunculus raid is as much a battle as a pursuit of knowledge, as a student of the mm. academia of pain can learn much from first-hand experiences. Although the your typical Elden Ring boss. Yeah, this kind of sounds like Elden Ring could... I wonder if uh, the creator of Elden Ring takes some inspiration from Warhammer, considering that most of the From Software games that I heard of are rather grim and dark and painful to play. You know what, guys? I found the best way for Drakari to survive for at least good chunk of time just make them play from software game that is enough of pain and suffering <laughs> they can't play it for too long because of course they will get very um bored and good at it after a certain time but you know it would take them like a year or two maybe but might have some kind of common source i'm not saying that he's like necessarily taking pieces of it but you know the abominations some of them are very interesting in, in, in this, from software games. Dark Eldar only control a small portion of the vast empire they once ruled over. They still represent an unprecedented terror and danger. They are a dying people cursed by a chaos god to feed on this universe like a blasphemous parasite, siphoning suffering and anguish from the living to cling to existence for just a bit longer. There is mm. no excess too great for the Drukhari, no taboos and no mercy as honor and chivalry are for the weak. They are a species that is destined for inevitable extinction, and like a madman who knows death is just around the corner, they live life to the extreme, experiencing every sensation this galaxy has to offer to the most intense levels. There can be no peace while this twisted entity still lurks in the shadows of our galaxy, and no one can ever truly be safe. The moment you have finally found peace, the day everything seems to be going well, and the second you let your- Wait, 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 wait. Peace, moment everything goes well, in Warhammer universe, a universe where war is a daily occurrence. <laughs> uh. Guard down, that's when you hear the raiding sirens. That's the day your world will burn. And the only thing you can do is pray they don't take you alive. I love the way he ended that So one. what do you guys think? Did the Drukhari actually make a lot of sense to you? Like, is there a reason for them being as evil as they are? Or is there absolutely no excuse for doing what they do? Mm. 
I mean, to me personally, they, they just seem survival. like they're outright evil. And honestly, that's kind of why I enjoy playing them in the tabletop game. I've always liked the bad guys, especially guys <laughs> that are just like... Com Wait, wasn't it said that there is no good guys in this game? <laughs> completely cartoonishly evil. They're like the Skeletor of 40k if, you know... The Skeletor actually tortured people. <laughs> if you enjoyed this video, go ahead and click the subscribe button. But having you all here along on the ride with me, I mean, it seriously means the world, especially when you like, share, and subscribe to the channel, because again, that really helps me out. So thank you all for staying tuned and watching this all the way through, and until next time, happy wargaming. Mmm, that was a very fun video. That that explained a lot about the Drakari currently, like what is their status kind of thing. Are there some lesser evil guys? Well, yeah, we know that there are lesser evil guys here and there. We know that, we know that. Yeah, yeah, it was a very fun video. I really enjoyed it. I, I really think it was informative and very, very nice. Uh, well written and well explained, so I understood basically everything what was said i understand the factions i understood why they coexist how they coexist and yeah these boys are just crazy man they're they're just crazy <laughs>